Before we hear from the panel, I'm delighted to announce that we have again this year Dr. Henry Chin, uh, Head of Research for Asia Pacific here with us to share his global insights. Uh, following this, our Head of Research for Australia, Stephen McNabb, will then set the scene from an Australian perspective. And we just published a paper yesterday about the investment intention survey, which we have uh, more than 300 respondents to respond our survey, which is the largest number to answer for Asia Pacific Investment Intention Survey. And 80% of those respondents are actually in Asia Pacific, cover you know, occupiers, investors, REITs, and the banks. So the result is very, very meaningful. To start with, we asked the investors, are you interested in investing in real estate in 2015? The result you can see, you know, only 54% of investors, they want to put more money into real estate compared to last year. But the sentiment still you know, positive. Although we start seeing around 10% of also 10% of investors they try to sell real estate more this year compared to last year. Largely, the sentiment remains positive. Okay. We also ask the investors, what sort of asset classes you want to invest, investment style you want to invest in 2015. There's a clear shift for the risk appetite. Last year, it's all about say, good secondaries. They move up the risk return spectrum. Now, this year, you can see 40 plus percent of investors, they switch their focus back to prime core asset. And the other 40 percent of investors, they want to go to the other end of the risk return spectrum. Three markets that continue to dominate in our region. China, Japan, and Australia. Two thirds of investors want to invest in these three locations. Okay, you can see Japan last year was number two, uh, increased number three, and uh, Australia just slide from number two to number three, slide down one, one spot here. There's a clear differences here. You can see that investors, they all continue to focus on the mature markets. We have seen the, the rankings moving up for the mature economies. Hong Kong, Singapore, New Zealand and South Korea are in the investors' uh, radar screen for 2015. The sectors, which sectors investors want to invest, you can see office continue to dominate the investors' appetite in 2015, followed by the industrial and logistic. And then, surprise, surprise, you can see number three is hotels. In 2014's survey, only 1% of investors they are interested in the hotel sectors. But in 2015, there's nearly 13% of investors say they want to go into the hotel spaces. So my job today is just to drill us into Australia a little more closely um, and cover four sectors. I think in terms of the economic backdrop, there's really four key themes that we should be considering this year. The first one is we are experiencing a gradual economic recovery. It's concentrated in the southeast of Australia. That is starting to support property demand this year and I think it will get stronger in 2016 and more broad based. The interest rate cuts that we are seeing or cut we've had, cut we expect will happen in the next quarter will provide a bit more confidence for this view. We shouldn't underestimate the power of the lower Australian dollar. It's fallen much faster and much more sharply than certainly we were expecting and most market um, participants were expecting a year ago but that's going to take a lot of pressure off a number of industries that were struggling under the higher Australian dollar. Lower oil prices. The most significant impact of lower oil prices is it adds to consumer wallets. So it supports retail demand. So it will support, I think, a continuation of the improvement in the sales environment that we've seen for retailers. And finally, and very importantly, valuations are very sensitive to interest rates. So while the underlying fundamentals haven't shifted necessarily in terms of leasing, market fundamentals, 
the capital market and valuation fundamentals have shifted because we've moved from an environment where we weren't expecting rate cuts to one where we've had one and we're expecting another one. So valuation is very sensitive to that and you can see from the movement in the stock market just in the last month or so since the rate cut what that means. A lot of elements supporting the property markets at the moment. And I think if you summarise that, what does it mean? Normally after we see the Australian dollar fall and oil prices fall with a five quarter lag, you see quite a significant uplift in returns. So this is a negative correlation. Australian dollar falls, property returns go up. Retail seems to be the biggest beneficiary from that because as I said, it's putting more dollars back into consumer wallets. Um, but it does support all the sectors. So let's talk about residential briefly. Hot topic, hot topic down here in Melbourne particularly. I think the fundamental driver of activity that we've seen is a relative shift in values. So residential values have increased by about 15% in the last two years, 5% last year, and the growth rate's exceeding the, the growth rate that you're seeing in capital values for other sectors. So it's really promoting activity in, in that market compared to where we were seven years ago. Obviously Melbourne's had a boom for the last five, which is pretty closely aligned with the trends we're seeing in that graph. And it's really driving now, I think, much more interest in site acquisitions from cross-border investors. So you can see the pretty good correlation between that value shift and activity. We saw just under 40 development site sales in Melbourne last year. Um, average value was about 20, 24 million per site. Across the country, I think, is in Sydney, you're tending to see acquisitions of larger, what are still today productive secondary grade assets. So the valuations tend to be higher on those and you're getting a different product brought into the market in the residential space. In terms of office, again, what's the outlook? Um, probably the best way to summarise that is to look at the mix between demand and supply, and this is a percent of the stock. You can see that Melbourne, over the next three years, actually looks like the most balanced market in Australia, outside of Canberra. Um, can't forget Canberra. So the increases in vacancy we expect to see in Melbourne from today, to 2017 are actually fairly modest, so that's one and a half percent. And compare that to markets like Brisbane and Perth. So you can see that investors in the pricing, investors are pricing in more risk in markets like Brisbane and Perth, particularly in secondary markets. Whereas Sydney and Melbourne, which are a little more balanced or where the vacancy peak will be lower, and 10, 10 and a half percent is very low in terms of, in terms of a, a vacancy peak by cyclical standards, um, investors still have confidence in those markets. In terms of capital values and rents, um, what's the outlook there? So, you know, given vacancy is moving higher, um, we expect rent growth will be fairly, fairly stable over, the, you know, fairly flat over the next 12 months. We look for some improvement beyond 2017. There's clearly been a divergence between where capital values have gone and where rent growth has gone over the last three years. I think we'll see a reversal of that going forward for a couple of reasons. One, we will enter a phase where we get rent growth. Um, that'll probably line up with a period where interest rates are going up again. Um, so what that'll mean is capital values will be fairly stable because you'll have two offsetting factors and rents will catch up. So if we see some yield, um, yield softening in, in the future, it's more likely to be associated with stable capital values rather than declining capital values, which we saw after the GFC. Look, the key driver in industrial at the moment is what's happening to demand. And the best measure of demand um, that we have for industrial is what does the output of the industrial economy look like? And you can see there that it's been either contracting or flat at best over the last three years. So it's been a fairly benign environment in terms of growth for business um, in that sector. Now I'd say logistics is probably punching a little above that average and manufacturing is obviously more negative than that. Retail, sustaining the momentum. So retail of all sectors is one that's displayed some rent growth momentum over the last 12 months, which we expected as a response to the improvement in the retail trading environment we saw kick in towards the end of 2013. Um, so last year, for example, we had about 10% growth in prime CBD rents for retail. Most of that's centered in Sydney and Melbourne. But we've also started to see growth now in large format retail, you know, about 1.5% growth nationally in large format retail um, in 2014. So we are seeing that response to the, a better trading environment. We're also seeing a response to tight vacancies 
and tight vacancies have been brought about by strong demand for space from international retailers, been a key element to that. So we think um, going forward, as we can see there, we'll, we'll get between 2 to 3% rent growth uh, across the sector over the next couple of years. And that's, that's really supported confidence in the market, supported pretty sharp compression in yields, particularly at the riskier end of the retail spectrum. So we saw last year um, pretty strong compression in large format retail, closer to 100 basis points in some markets. And we also started to see sub-regional and neighbourhood centre yields compress. What are the key issues that we see for retailers? So last year we did a survey of consumers across Asia Pac. Um, this is the Australian results. Um, one thing we often hear is, yes, the e-commerce is an emerging trend. Um, what the survey tells us though is a lot of people still do go to shops um, most frequently to make a purchase. So not to search, to make a purchase. Even amongst the younger demographic, 50% are going to shops to make purchases. Clearly, as we move out the demographic um, age groups, that increases. But what that means is that as the younger groups mature, that we will, in fact, see more and more activity happen online. But it, this also tells us it doesn't necessarily mean it's the death of the physical store. Um, so there's still opportunities there. Investment markets. What is the outlook there? And what sort of trends are we seeing? Well, last year we saw um, the strongest year in 10 in terms of turnover in the Melbourne market, about $8 billion of transactions. The strongest growth, not surprisingly, office again, a couple of large transactions here. We are seeing that, you know, look through the volatility, the arrow for foreign investment still rising. There's obviously some big headline names there that you see. The 25% number though is important. A lot of smaller Chinese private investor groups, you see that in Melbourne, Sydney, um, they're really driving a lot of the growth in activity at the moment. But we'll start with Mark Costa. Mark, Stephen and Henry have given you more reason to smile again this year. Look, I think um, Office remains really, really popular right around you know, the country, but particularly the, the Sydney Melbourne story is a really good one. In Melbourne, you know, investors are really concentrating or continue to concentrate on the on the prime sectors. So, you know, much like what uh, what Stephen was saying, there is that that yield gap, that potential opportunity to capture some value in that secondary space. Um, with the bulk of money still really chasing core or trying to create core, uh, there's some real sort of a mismatch in pricing between the better secondary stock and ability to create some some rental growth, create some some assets that have a different type, style of accommodation, probably Andrew can speak to that around, you know, not boxing yourself into the conventional. Look, I think it's, um, I think it's really interesting that the divergence in the different sectors of the market. So, you know, if I look at certain subsectors within the market and think about what I think looks really good on fundamentals, we focus a hell of a lot of our time and effort on the premium in the A grade end of the market because the institutional investment story, but if you start to pull the layers of the market apart and look, you know, say East End, better grade, better B grade, I see that as an extraordinary opportunity. It's really dramatically undersupplied. We've got people fighting over some of that space. It's all about the differentiation of the product, I think. You know, the, what you don't want to be doing is just dishing up more of the same stock that you're competing with with everybody else. You need to find differentiation in your product. If you find differentiation in your product, then you become a price maker, not a price taker to a certain extent, and you get a better return. Demand is going to continue to head in a very, very strong direction for Prime Office, and to the extent that yields are going to continue to compress, particularly now we've got some green, green shoots in that um, demand side for the occupiers. Um, but that's also going to come with an increasing level of demand for better quality B grade space. We're still seeing a bit of a lack of demand in the in the C grade space, at least in the institutional space, although, you know, with recent sort of real-time examples on, particularly on Collins Street, 410, 446 Collins Street, um, there's a huge amount of demand from, from private sector money for that type of space. It, it's one of those situations where 12 months ago we had, we had very different clients, we really did, and we'd go to a meeting and we'd talk purely industrial. Now we get about 20 minutes in and all of a sudden we're talking about office. Um, 
And that goes back to that conversation about it really is an allocation of capital. It's not so much property fundamental based right now. I think we'll shift back to fundamentals, Ari, but right now it really is a capital conversation. It's staggering how many times we'll start off a meeting and all of a sudden the first question's about debt. It's not even about the property at the moment. So it's a different kind of market in that respect. But I think the most interesting thing that we're seeing is the emergence of the non-banks into the Australian market. Australia had a small non-bank market many years ago, as those of us who've been around long enough can remember, Um, but it's largely disappeared um, and it was largely sort of funded incorrectly. It was funded off um, retail investments and and trying to uh, uh, lend against commercial properties. Now the global players are here, and and by the global players we mean the, the, the massive insurance companies and pension funds that sit on a global stage and they're looking at bringing their money into the market. Um, and they're looking really at long-term returns for their investors, whether they're pension funds or whether they're insurance companies. So it really gives the, uh, the property owner a, a, a different way of looking at it. In Australia, we've been used to the banks providing three- to five-year money, uh, which they're still very good at and still very competitive at. But if you've got a long-term asset with a long-term strategy and you want to de-risk it, then now you can genu- genuinely put finance on there for five, seven, ten 15 years um, and lock away the finance for that uh, length of time and with interest rates where they are at the moment it's very attractive for people who've got that type of, uh, uh, of asset base or, or portfolios. At retail, um, believe the hype, it, um, at, th- at this moment we've actually seen unprecedented demand from um, international retailers and it's back by, backed up by their sales. Um, H&M here in GPO in Melbourne did 21 million in the first eight weeks of trade. Annualised, that goes out to about 100 million. That, that on a global scale, is, is close to being number one um, global opening of all time. Um, albeit small, uh, Victoria's Secret has opened in Emporium in Melbourne, um, and that was the number one global of opening of, of all time. You're going to hear this is a reoccurring theme. Sephora opened in Sydney. Um, end of last year and um, that was number one global of opening of all time. Um, so Ari, it, it is, it's, it's not hype, it, 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 it's here, it's happening. So I'd like to think that over the next few years we will see more and more of our global potential come into this market to really provide advantages for our clients here. So I'd like to thank you again very much for coming and look forward to working with you.